Well, Luke's account of Jesus' famous parable of the Good Samaritan is, of course, linked crucially in his narrative to the discussion of the two great commandments. The account is full of irony and double entendre. It's a rich scene, this teacher, this scribe approaches Jesus, trying to call him out as a bit of an imposter with no formal training and no right to claim to be a teacher. He challenges Jesus' claim. So to put Jesus on the spot and to put him in his place, this scribe asks Jesus nothing less than Tell us how to get to heaven. How do we gain eternal life? And Jesus, like any skilled teacher, responds with a question of his own. What do you think? What do you read in Scripture? The scribe is now suddenly on the spot himself, but responds well under pressure with, of course, the Shema, Israel. Love God. You shall love God with all your heart, your mind, your strength, your heart, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus answered, right, do this, and you'll have life. But as you see in the story, the scribe's disappointed that Jesus turned the table on him. So he hopes to expose the ignorance of this shoeless Galilean and he persists, who's my neighbor? And so Jesus tells us this rich story, but we can't understand the story without first understanding that it's linked to the Shema. It's linked to these two great commandments. And you know the story, and we just read it, so I won't repeat it, but let's note three quick things. First, obviously, the story is Jesus' way of admonishing this scribe, and really all of us, that everyone is our neighbor, even half-breed Jews and strangers like this Samaritan, even the most unlikely person in your and my life. We're called to help others in need, to go and do likewise, especially seeking out those we least expect or want to serve. But there are a couple other details in the story that really hold important deeper lessons for us. For example, Luke is careful to tell us, doesn't need to tell us, but wants to tell us, Jesus wants to tell us that our two protagonists in the story who refuse to help the stranger are pious Jews no less than a priest and a scholar of the law. And moreover, we can't ignore where this scene takes place. Anyone who heard this story knew what the story was about. These two pious Jews were coming, traveling on the road from Jerusalem down to Jericho with really only one possible interpretation. They're returning from worship in the temple and they pass on the opposite side of the road. Why? Well, they can't risk ritual impurity. They've just offered worship in the temple, and touching anything bloodied, such as this victim, would render them unclean, non-kosher, incapable of participating in the rites of the temple. So here is the real scandal of the story, and this is what really burns the scribe and those who listen to it. This half-breed Jew doesn't worship in the temple, and therefore he doesn't have to pass to the other side. And of course, now the scribe and the pious around who are listening are seething because Jesus is placing a higher premium on loving service than he, than he is on ritual worship. So the story is about how, a, how wonderful it is that a Samaritan, a sworn enemy of the Jews, 
would help a Jew. That love recognizes no boundaries, even the boundaries that religion itself can place upon us. But there's yet another layer to the story as it connects back to the Shema. And that is this. The only way to love God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength is to love your neighbor. Imagine what Jesus is saying to us. Imagine what Jesus is saying to the scribe. He's claiming that the priest and the Levite were so concerned about worshiping God, as they understood it, that they missed the whole point of Scripture. Absolutely anything that prevents us from serving our neighbor cannot be considered worship of God or love of God. Anything that pre prevents us from serving our neighbor in need cannot be considered the love of God. So the story is a direct provocation of good, solid, learned, respectable people like us, pious people who wash their hands before lunch with ritual correctness. It's not hard to understand that direct challenges such as these led good, solid, God-fearing people to conclude that there was one thing to do with this Galilean, destroy him. So we celebrate this evening the people in our lives who've taught us to walk to the opposite side of the road, even when it seemed inconvenient, even when it seemed impious. The story invites us to remember and celebrate the people in our lives who've served as living witnesses to this giving of self as a parent or a friend. And we do so very appropriately tonight, and we will do so tonight in the context of the Eucharist. How perfect. For the Eucharist, the Eucharist is the source and summit of our life as a community of faith in Christ. We will eat this bread in a moment and drink this cup so that we might have life, so that we might be refreshed. This evening, Christ himself crosses that same road that we're on from Jerusalem to, to our own Jericho, gathers us up in our own brokenness into his arms, reaches deeply into our wounds to heal them tonight, to refresh us, to bring us new and deeper life. The Eucharist is the great living embodiment of who Jesus is, God's self-revelation as a human being, the one who gives himself away continuously, freely, fully, and without bounds. So the story of the Good Samaritan is ultimately a metaphor for the Eucharist. If you wish to experience God, Jesus is saying, then become the Eucharist. Give yourself away, as I have given myself away. This sacrament either is lived out in our daily lives, or this sacrament becomes empty ritual. So may we experience new life in Christ, and that new life in abundance. And may we become, little by little, by the grace of God, the Eucharist.